All right, I wanna welcome everyone to today's webinar entitled Shaping Wisconsin's Future Grid, Innovation, Resil Resilience, and the Power of Partnerships. Uh, glad so many of you are joining us virtually today. Uh, if, my name is Scott Williams. I'm the Research and Education Coordinator at the Wisconsin Energy Institute at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And if this is your first time joining uh, one of our programs, the Wisconsin Energy Institute's mission is to provide leadership at UW-Madison for multidisciplinary research, education, outreach, uh, that accelerate the world's transition to clean energy systems and solutions. And we're proud to host today's webinar in partnership with the Wisconsin State Office of Energy Innovation, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, or WARF, as well as WISIS, uh, and to bring this idea of, of partnerships uh, all across the state. So the goal uh, of today's webinar is to discuss opportunities uh, for partnerships between uh, UW system researchers, state government, and local communities in order to build a more resilient, clean, innovative, and inclusive electrical grid for Wisconsin. So many of you know the, the bipartisan infrastructure law is providing a once in a generation opportunity to upgrade and transform our state's electrical infrastructure. And unlocking this potential transformation requires tapping into the collective expertise of academia, businesses, nonprofits, and state and local governments. So today we'll get a better understanding of the funding opportunities uh, available from the federal government and we'll begin to explore ways in which we can partner with state government to take advantage of these opportunities and create lasting and impactful change. Before I turn it over to today's moderator, I want to highlight a few logistical notes. Uh, we are recording this webinar and we encourage you to share the recording with colleagues across the state. Uh, we'll send out a link to all who registered uh, to the recording later this week. Live captioning is turned on. You can toggle this feature using the live transcript button in Zoom. Uh, and we encourage you to use the chat feature to introduce yourself and which organization you're representing today. Uh, we also ask that you put any questions you may have in the chat uh, so that we have a record of questions and comments uh, from you all. Uh, hopefully we get a lot of questions from you all. Uh, and if we do run out of time, uh, our speakers would be happy to follow up afterward. Now to moderate today's session and introduce our speakers, I'm pleased to welcome Megan Levy from the Wisconsin Office of Energy Innovation. Megan is currently the Resilience Strategist and Energy, Assur uh, Energy Assurance Coordinator for the state. She also oversees the Energy Independent Communities Program, which counts more than 147 communities as members. In addition to these responsibilities, she has more than a decade of experience working with building energy efficiency, both with the Low Income Weatherization Program, as well as the Wisconsin State Energy Office, which is now known as the Office of Energy Innovation. Welcome, Me Megan. All right, thanks so much, Scott. I appreciate the warm introduction and I appreciate your partnership in putting this uh, this whole thing together. Um, and thanks so much to all of you for tuning in today. We're gonna start with a little overview of this Infrastructure Investment in Jobs Act, because as, as Scott mentioned, it is a historic investment, but what we know is that alone, it's not gonna be quite enough. So here to talk to you about uh, some strategies that we're deploying at the state of Wisconsin is Mr. Joe Pater. He's the director of the Office of Energy Innovation at the Public Service Commission of Wisconsin. He started working in the energy efficiency industry in 2009 as a project manager implementing lighting and appliance programs. As the director of OEI, he leads the team that is responsible for the oversight of the Focus on Energy program and the Wisconsin State Energy Office, which is uh, what I'm a part of. So Joe, take it away. Thank you, Megan. And yeah, I'll kick us off here um, by just giving you a quick, um, you know, I'm sure most folks here are familiar with OEI, but just give you a, a quick overview of our vision and mission and the programs that we operate. Um, you know, we recently recrafted our vision with our delegated commissioner, uh, Commissioner Tyler Hebner. And that vision now is that Wisconsin homes, businesses, and vehicles are powered with clean, efficient, reliable energy that creates jobs and grows our economy in an equitable manner where all can share in the benefits. And, you know, I think what we're really aiming for there is uh, a clean energy future where we bring everybody along and, um, you know, everybody reaps the benefits of uh, renewable energy for the long term um, and really finds benefit in their lives. And our mission is to develop Wisconsin's energy landscape to be secure, environmentally responsible, and growing the state's economy for all. Um, and just a quick note on OEI, you know, we are at the Public Service Commission, um, but we are not part of the regulatory team that operates uh, and works with the utilities on rates and uh, construction cases. 
we are the team that is responsible for market acceleration, um, you know, clean energy adoption, uh, working through the challenges related to equity. Uh, you know, that's our world. So, you know, at any time, feel free to come to us with great ideas, things that you think the market needs here in Wisconsin to move forward, maybe technology insights that you're seeing in the market. Um, we are always open ears and, you know, we are not the, the dry public service commission part of, uh, or I'm sorry, we're not the office, uh, the dry part of the PSC. Uh, we are the forward leaning part of the PSC. So please come to us with great ideas. And, you know, we're serving you, um, you know, in the bottom line here. So as Megan mentioned, you know, we've got two pieces. We've got the state energy office, which has federal responsibilities through DOE. And we get um, a federal grant from DOE uh, that is, you know, what we use to operate our programming. And then we also oversee the Focus on Energy program, which is our statewide efficiency and renewable energy resource program. Um, we provide support to the CIRA board and the administrator. And, you know, that administrator is the one who operates the program uh, with all the implementation teams. So again, uh, I'll just make a mention here. If you've got any really great insights into what Focus could be doing in the future, um, we are always open ears. And actually we have a, a, public, a publicly available uh, moment in time right now where the quad planning process has begun. And um, the next four year cycle is, is being planned right now and commission, the commission is making decisions related to what that four year period is gonna look like. And I threw the docket number in there, uh, 5FE104, if you want to participate. And then uh, our email address right there at the bottom. Uh, but the bulk of what I'll talk about here in the next couple of minutes is on the next slide, if we could go to the next one. Um, bipartisan infrastructure law funding. So uh, I guess what I want to say right now is that we are kind of at a very early, not very early stage, but in the front end of planning and preparing what the state is going to pursue, at least from our lens at State Energy Office. And there's three different programs that are uh, going to come our direction that we're going to be responsible to operate and, um, you know, put into market. And those are the three on the left. Uh, the State Energy Program Formula Funding, we're going to get uh, approximately $10 million to be spent over five years. Uh, it's very likely that the first memo related to this work is going to come out this summer under docket 9705 FG 2022. And um, so I would just maybe subscribe to that if you want to participate or pay attention to what we're going to be doing with, uh, with that uh, stream of funding. Um, and, you know, I'll say that it's likely that we are going to operationalize or um, fund some of the existing programming that we have, including uh, the Energy Innovation Grant Program, our Critical Infrastructure Microgrid Program. Uh, so you can kind of think of it as we're putting more, uh, more emphasis behind our existing programs, but we're also, I think, looking for uh, really great ideas uh, to move the market forward. In the second one is EECBG, which the you know long form is Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant Program. There's going to be many communities and counties uh, are, that are going to get direct allocation from the Department of Energy. Um, we don't yet know who, we don't yet know how much, uh, but we do expect to get that information here uh, sometimes in the next 90 to 120 days or so. Uh, but for the, the communities and the counties that don't get direct allocation, our office is going to get $2 million to distribute to those uh, communities. So um, more information to come on that. And then the third one is a revolving loan fund grant program, which uh, is something that we're still kind of piecing together planning on. Uh, the way the guidance is written is it can go for auditing, uh, energy efficiency or renewable energy measure installation. Uh, so it's kind of like an open-ended, it can be residential or commercial or both. And, um, you know, some of the challenges we have regarding that is uh, just quite simply, we're, we're not really an agency that's set up to do uh, small loans. Uh, so we'll be likely looking for partnerships in that. So those three on the left are the ones that our office is going to have direct responsibility for. 
Um, but there are there are a ton of competitive opportunities, and I'm going to punch something in the chat here, which has a really nice one page overview of all of the opportunities across the bill. Um, and there's just three of them that I've posted here on the slide. Uh, the upgrading our electric grid, uh, the grants for EE and renewables in schools, and the energy storage demonstration projects. Uh, and I listed there in the middle column the eligible entities and then the approximate time frame of when these opportunities are going to open up. Uh, we are having early conversations with a lot of different, uh, a lot of different folks, internal stakeholders, or I should say, uh, interagency stakeholders, you know, other folks across the state government. Uh, we're talking to counties, we're talking to the tribes, uh, we're talking to um, you know, some of the private groups that um, like the unions, for example, um, trying to get folks aware of all the competitive opportunities that are coming because it it is very massive. And, you know, the speakers here uh, are going to be telling you all about, you know, their lens on this stuff. Uh, what I think what we really need to do right now is just simply make people aware and start to form partnerships and get um, get groups together that are going to pursue these competitive opportunities and put Wisconsin, uh, put our best foot forward for Wisconsin and get really aggressive on some of these. Um, so I'll just uh, also mention too, if any of the folks here on the call would like to engage with PSC in our office on any of these programs, um, it could be that you've got a great idea for a competitive grant. Um, maybe you already have an existing partnership and uh, you have something coming together and you just want the support of the state energy office. Maybe you're going to need a letter of support, that kind of thing. Um, let's talk about that now. So reach out to us at OEI at Wisconsin and we'll start the conversation. Um, and then I'll leave you with two just real quick. The next slide is a recent round of EIGP that was awarded. Um, you know, this is just general awareness, making people aware of what our office is doing. Um, the commission recently approved $10 million uh, for activities related to renewable energy, storage, efficiency, demand response, beneficial electrification, and comprehensive energy planning. I know many of you are well aware of this already. Um, this is the, you know, the map of where all the projects landed across the state. Uh, we're really proud of you know this work and we feel like what we're trying to do here is stimulate certain pockets of the state and, and bring technology um, into the mainstream and kind of spread the knowledge so thank you if you are participant on any of these projects or if you applied for for any of them uh pretty pumped about that and then the last slide is just you know i'll leave you with uh the simkirk version of this this is something the commission decided last year uh, but these projects are just coming to fruition now. They're finalizing uh, the work. And it really was feasibility studies for microgrids. Um, so and that's, this is actually one of the programs that Megan operates. So, um, you know, she can speak more to this. But again, uh, you know, the technology around microgrids and storage combined with renewables uh, is obviously our future in a lot of ways. And we've got to accelerate that work as as best we can. So I'll pause there. And um, yeah, I already see Patrick Sullivan's note here about long duration energy storage. That's wonderful. Um, so thank you. I'll pass it back to you, Megan. Okay, thanks so much, Joe. appreciate it. Um, and that's a, a very brief overview of some of the many programs. I think Department of Energy alone will have 62 new programs on the street, and they've actually reorged the entire uh, department, which is uh, <laughs> is part of part of a challenge, but also an opportunity. They've added a community and local uh, partnerships portion of the Department of Energy that I think will be quite interesting. And one thing Joe didn't mention, but I think is worth mentioning, is that there are um, there are funds that are not competitive, 2.5 billion in grid resilience funding that will be coming through the investment uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And we know that's just a portion of what we need really to transform our grid to the goals that we have. Um, and to that end, we've got some great panelists to sort of talk to you, talk you through that. First and foremost, we've got Maria Redmond. She's the director of the Wisconsin Office of Sustainability and Clean Energy, uh, created by Executive Order 38. 
uh, her office embodies the goal of clean energy, carbon-free electricity in particular for Wisconsin by 2050. So how we're going to get there is, is something that we really need to talk about and plan, and we're gonna need all of these partnerships to get through. So um, Maria is the former director of the Office of Energy Innovation, the very first one we ever had. And um, she's just completed this statewide clean energy plan, um, sort of a roadmap. So I'm really excited to dig into that, to understand you know, the implementation strategy, how we can all help, and certainly how we can leverage the great minds of our University of Wisconsin system. So without further ado, there's she's got an awesome bio on the website. I don't want to read the whole thing. Um, I'll just pass it over to you to Maria to talk a little bit about the clean energy plan and how that dovetails with some of these historic um, opportunities with the funding. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate the um, invitation and to join in on the discussion. Um, if you haven't read the 170 page uh, clean energy plan, um, I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, we will be publishing a 10 page, well, printed out, it's about 10, eight to 10 pages, um, but also that's gonna be available in English, Spanish and Hmong um, in an effort to get um, the word out about clean energy, the clean energy tran transition, workforce opportunities, all of the above to as many communities as possible. So really the clean energy plan um, was, what we're trying to do is focus on emissions in the state and that between 1990 and 2005, gross emissions in the state increased in all but three years. And many states, including Wisconsin, reached their emissions peak in 2005. And so since then, we've seen kind of this, this up and down of emissions in the state and, and some years trending up and some years trending down Overall, because of what we've seen in the utility sector and you know, grid modernization, carbon reduction goals, we're seeing a lot of um, emissions reductions already underway. And so we wanted to take a look at where in our system are we seeing a lot of emissions and how do we tackle those? Because there's um, repercussions within communities, uh, health, economic, um, that need to be addressed as part of this. And so electricity is our main focus, 100% carbon-free electricity consumed in the state by 2050. But we also recognize the interdependencies of other sectors with, with the electricity sector. So as we're seeing more electrification of transportation system, the shift away from fossil fuels, we will see more demand on the elect electricity sector as well as um, buildings and uh, you know, as we're looking to electrify buildings and industry, we're going to see that as well. And so what we wanted to do was create a, a clean energy plan and really to outline strategies that one directly address climate change, but also incorporate environmental justice and ensure that we accelerate progress towards a clean energy economy. And so this is one of many steps uh, towards meeting our carbon free power and climate goals while staying within our carbon budget. And that is the amount of carbon that we're allowed to release before temperatures, global temperatures go up. So we wanna make sure that we're reducing temperatures and contributing to emissions reductions across the globe. So this plan offer is, I just wanna emphasize that this, this clean energy plan really differs from a climate action plan, that it doesn't include strategies on non-energy related greenhouse gas emission reductions like carbon sequestration and adaptation that the Governor's Task Force on Climate Change report really provided the holistic view uh, and a holistic uh, approach to climate action. But the CEP and the Clean, Clean Energy Plan really um, creates more than 80 strategies across multiple sectors that move us towards a clean energy economy. So really honing in on the energy aspects. Um, while keeping in mind that the governor is committed to ensure that we look at the you know other uh, sequestration opportunities and make sure that we're looking at climate impacts from a holistic point of view. So really each strategy within the clean energy plan is really designed to maximize environmental and economic benefits for, for all communities in the state with a particular focus on frontline marginalized communities of color and low income communities and making sure that we're maximizing clean energy job creation, leading to an equitable transition. And so 
we woven throughout the document, we have um, what we did is we we really we didn't we didn't start from scratch. <laughs> there are a lot of different strategic initiatives going on in the state, and so we had the Energy Distribution Technology Initiative that was that was uh, a group of advocates, utilities, transmission providers um, that and Governor's Task Force on Climate Change, the Mid Continent Power Sector roadmaps and buildings, uh, roadmaps. And really we took all those strategies together and we said, hey, what would be a good set to start with? And so as we were starting to build the build out the clean energy plan, there's some pathways that just really stood out. And so when you look at the clean energy plan, you'll see four major pathways that we're running to start with that really create that path towards a clean, reliable and affordable energy future, making sure that we keep reliable and affordable in, in the forefront of our minds. So accelerating clean energy technology deployment, this is like increasing funding options for projects, investing in infrastructure, new emissions goals, expanding energy uh, resources for generation, technology innovation, um, making sure that we're supporting businesses that are working in this space and supporting the workforce, maximizing energy efficiency, this is another another pathway, strengthening our energy efficiency standards. We know that we have, um, as Joe mentioned, the focus on energy program is our flagship program. There's a lot we can do that with that program, but there's a lot more that we can do with our utility utilities and our local governments and getting into communities and teaching them about um, reducing their energy costs. Modernizing buildings and industry is the third one. Um, addressing building codes. Um, you may have seen that the uh, a win for uh, our efforts that the Department of Safety and Professional Services just announced they're accepting applications for a new a sustainable building council that they're establishing to help provide the technical expertise to both the building and residential codes councils to be able to be more forward thinking to make sure we get our codes up to date and, and make sure that we um, are, are really leading the way and thinking about solar ready, EV ready, like all of the technology uh, opportunities um, that, that can come through building codes and help stimulate uh, the movement on that side. And then of course, innovating in transportation, supporting the transition to low to no emission vehicles, supporting refueling options, and the planning and increased options just to move people around. So transportation, I know everybody's super excited about electric vehicles. That's gonna you know, come along, but there's things that we also can think about, like how are we moving people around the state and what are the options um, to reduce our emissions that way? So within all of these strategies, we also have um, uh, sort of all encompassing strategies and that's prioritizing health equity, environmental justice and equitable economic development making sure that we're fast tracking workforce development and it's just transition. Uh, we are looking to create a uh, inventory of clean jobs and try to figure out how do we, how do we get people into those in, and Wisconsin workers and Wisconsin businesses into the development of you know, these technologies and deploying these technologies um, in the state. And then accelerating our government led efforts to ensuring that we as a state and our local governments are leading by example. Um, so that's a really high <laughs> overview of a very large document. Um, one of the uh, things that I want to emphasize is that we have three core values in the clean energy plan, um, justice, equity, and collective action. And I've kind of touched on the equity, um, but I want to lean in on the collective action because that's really um, strategic partnerships are a big part of, of this. Um, the, the thing is, is that we can't do this by ourselves. Government's not gonna do it by themselves. Utilities aren't gonna do that by themselves. We need innovation and technology. We need, um, we need to build up the economy here in the state and look at what, 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 what makes Wisconsin unique and, and what do we have to offer in, in this transition. And there's a lot of opportunity here. And so I think the, the collective action is a really big part of this. And I'll, Another part of this is that we recognize that federal investment and broad federal action are really necessary for any state to advance clean energy initiatives. So a partnership between the state and federal government is crucial. Um, we're seeing a lot of that in discussions, but it's also really important to have discussions on the local level, to plan, um, to really get those ideas going to help support um, 
building out applications. Um, we in the clean energy plan want to provide, have the state provide technical assistance where we can um, to help bring as many of those dollars here to the state of Wisconsin. So the strategies in the clean energy plan really create that base of like the things that we wanna do, but we wanna bring in the federal funding. And really this is the first phase. So we wanna put into practice um, the process for equitable, inclusive and impactful clean energy planning and implementation. And we know that the infrastructure law and all of the collaborative and strategic planning efforts and the strategic relationships that we're building across the state are so important and that we will, we will see. I have confidence I'm, I'm hopelessly optimistic that we will see a lot of those dollars come to Wisconsin because of these working relationships. Happy to stop there. <laughs> Hopefully I didn't take up too much time, but um, uh, when happy to answer questions in the next phase, but I really appreciate the opportunity and would encourage you to uh, take a look at the plan, react, uh, respond, and let me know what you think and happy to meet with you individually uh, to share ideas and continue throughout this process. Well, thank you so much, Maria. That was great. Clearly, we could have you talk the whole time about this <laughs> awesome plan. Um, but just to underscore, you know, as, as a person who's working almost every day in energy security, I see we have a few on the call as well. You know, just the equity component is so key because if we're not all, if we don't all have access, then then we might as well, none of us, right? And, and I just, um, I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head. This is about that impactful collaboration, um, but also, I just, I just love the idea that, that, yes, the state provides technical assistance, but to bring the voices from the community forward, because we, we can no longer sit in our ivory towers and tell people what they need, right? We need to get out and, and find it out. And, and I think that um, it's just really impressive, all this work. And, and thank you so much for, for highlighting those aspects of the plan. There's a lot in that big document. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate your time and your comments, and we will come back. Think of your questions for Maria. We're going to get back to her, but we've got to move on because we have this fantastic panel. I want to move now to Andrew Grattinger. He's the Associate Dean for Research, Engineering, and Applied Science at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Um, and as this Associate Dean for Research, he continues to build on UW-Milwaukee's um, R1 status in the college's work to advance the frontier of technology, enhance the economic growth and vitality of the region and provide world-class research opportunities and experience for UWM students. And selfishly, that's going to be my daughter in the fall. So I'm very, very excited. <laughs> to I am trying too. That's great. <laughs> I'm excited. So, so Andy, please uh, talk to us a little bit about what you guys are doing over there at uh, UWM. It sounds Thank you. Yeah, great. thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, just listening to this. I mean, there's so many pieces, so many aspects of this puzzle that we have to work on. And um, it really does take uh, universities and faculty members and researchers who have been focused on this their entire life to, to understand it, to put all the pieces together and to move us forward. And, and we're at this unique time where there's this financial opportunity that we really do need to, to, to go after. And I will say, I, I truly believe that Wisconsin is kind of uniquely positioned um, it's not like we we don't have a Tesla factory here, and we don't have this. And we have, but what do we have, right? We have a we have a, a a city and a community and a state that have a long history in manufacturing. We have electric uh, controls, electric motors, electric components that we've built. Um, kind of the you know the boxes that sit behind the factory, right? And the things that control the machines. You might not see it right away, but that's all part of our kind of infrastructure and our DNA. And so let's build on that. Let's take it to the next step and go from there. So at UWM, we kind of run the whole spectrum of energy and we've been doing it uh, a lot longer than what, maybe when energy was cool, right? And now energy is really cool, green energy. So we were set up to, to help out um, and we have a lot of partnerships with our industrial uh, uh, companies in the local area. So we, we, we start at the battery level, we do dust. We, we, we have researchers that come up with micrograms of something that might make a difference in batteries. And we'll test those in little button batteries and then we can take it up a step higher and make pouch cell batteries. And we have a dry room to actually run batteries and create batteries right here in our, in our school. And that gives us the opportunity to kind of test some of this stuff. So when it's a you know, million dollars a gram, we make a little bit and then we work to get the price down and we take it out. And we're working with companies around the, around the country. Um, some of the new auto manufacturers, the electric auto manufacturers send their secret sauce to us and we, we, we test it for them. So we're kind of at that level. And then you take a step up, we're doing battery systems where you put all these little cells together 
and you manage the heat, you manage the energy, and you manage how compact they are. We're doing digital twins of that, so we can actually model what's going on. We have a project with the Navy right now to, to work on some of their electric ships to see how these battery systems are going to work so they can get back to port after they do what the Navy does. So we're working on projects like that. And then if you go up another level, we, we've got a microgrid set up at one of our facilities. It's actually an old square D. So the, the, the breaker box in your basement might be a square D breaker box. It was built in Milwaukee and that company is now, that factory is now part of our system. So it's got wonderful power, wonderful resources, a great um, testing facility. And we have a microgrid there. So we have wind, we have solar, we have battery, we have generator backup. Uh, we have companies in, in Wisconsin that send us their, let's say, um, battery system in, in, a, in one of these shipping containers, and we'll put it outside and we'll test it, make sure it's working right. We have loads. Uh, we're planning on hooking that whole system up, our whole uh, research laboratory up to the building itself. So we'll be pulling off energy when we're not testing in that facility and putting it right into our own building and offsetting some of the energy costs. So we're, we're constantly working towards those kind of things. Um, and so we've got that. And then what we're working on too is we have a large room in the back where we're going to put a medium voltage. So we'll go from basically the 480 volts that we you would get off of your solar and your wind and things like that. We'll take that up to a thousand volts or maybe up to 13,000 volts and test that whole grid component. So imagine you've got a wind or you've got solar in your facility or your home. How does that work all the way through to get out and be shared with everybody? So you know, we're used to the unidirectional, we're buying power from the power company. And now we're into a bi-directional where we'll share some back to the power company. And now maybe we're into a place where we're gonna just go kind of like the internet of energy and I'll be just sharing it with you and you'll be sharing it with me. And how do we keep track of that? So we need to think, we, we have researchers working on blockchain where if I sell you a little and they sell me a little, everybody's keeping track of what's going on as far as money and energy moving back and forth. And then there's a lot of security too. That stuff does not run with somebody flipping a switch anymore. That's all on the internet and that all has to be secure. And so we're doing a lot of work with grid security too, to make sure that nobody can mess around and, and take down the power line that runs up the East Coast. You know, the fuel, the fuel uh, pipeline that runs up the East Coast, we wanna make sure we don't have that happen in the energy side of things. So we're working on that too. Um, we also have a, a EMI or a, a electromagnetic uh, chamber to make sure that, when we compress electric components down and make them small and light. So imagine electric plane, you can't have that big green transformer on your electric plane, but you could have something small. That's gonna throw off all sorts of electromagnetic waves and we have to understand that. So as we increase the voltage and decrease the size, all sorts of physics and interesting things goes on. And so we're studying that also and making sure that we can help out. So. So a lot of technology that we're working on that's gonna be implemented and then companies on the call listening or communities on the call, I think we can offer a lot of different things. Um, and you know, our partners up the street, Madison, we work with them all the time. Uh, I would say that the, the energy group, I, sometimes it's hard to say if that faculty member is working for us or for Madison or maybe even Marquette. We work together very closely in this space, um, all with our own little aspect of, of this very complicated puzzle. Um, but we're, like I said, we're, we're in a great shape in, in the state of Wisconsin. Well, fantastic. Thank you. And it just, a, it's a real embodiment of that Wisconsin idea. I think what you guys are doing over in Milwaukee um, just, and, and it sort of really demonstrates how can, how massive the energy sector is. Everything from, you know, minimizing or compressing things in an electromagnetic chamber to, uh, you know, all of these partnerships with businesses. I see we do have a raised hand amongst the participants. Um, and I think I know Maria, so uh, it's probably gonna be a good question. Maria, would you like to uh, unmute yourself and, and ask your question? I think you can unmute yourself. Megan, I accidentally raised my hand, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no problem, good, thanks for joining us. <laughs> We're on the uh, Wisconsin Impact of Climate Change Initiative Sustainable Communities uh, Committee together. So I, Maria, you always got something interesting to say. But um, but no, I I just I really appreciate your uh, 
you know, just your perspective on this particular, you know, from the material science stuff, which, cause I think that's what a lot of us, you know, we saw Patrick Sullivan's comment, long duration energy storage. When is it coming? Is this the key? Um, and it sounds like you're doing quite a bit of that research in, in Milwaukee. Do you have a sense of sort of the, the amount of DOE funding you have uh, within those battery labs or within sort of the, the institution as a whole right now? Yeah, so I don't, have, I don't have the exact number, but many departments, chemistry, physics, engineering is all working on that. And then we're working on not only just the DOE, and we do have DOE grants, quite a few of them. Um, in fact, Kamala Harris, Vice President Harris, came and visited us to see our energy labs about a year ago now. And it was because of our connection with the DOE. We have a, we have a large DOE grant that goes out and does industrial assessments to, to, to lower the energy impact of those, of those industries. And so uh, we have people out all the time doing uh, industry visits. Um, glad to do anyone on this call. If you, if you need that, we can get out there and help you uh, take a look at that energy impact. So that's one of the things. And the other thing too, I would say is that um, technology is one piece, but you mentioned it, the equity piece is another one. And, and Milwaukee's kind of uniquely situated, right? We have some economically depressed areas and that's a hard adoption for new technology, right? There, it's hard to buy a new, a new battery vehicle, electric vehicle. Where are you gonna charge it if you don't own the garage where the charger's gonna be? That's a challenge. Um, do you need it? Maybe micro mobility, something smaller, like an electric Trek bicycle might be a better way to get around. There's all sorts of things. And so we really need to engage that community, ask them what's going on and what their impact and impasses are and, and incorporate that into our research and our strategies, because otherwise we'll, again, leave people behind and that just doesn't work anymore. So. Great point. You know, just the same way sort of systemic inequities have, have grown up over time, we need to systemically change that, right? And then say, hey, just because you can't afford solar panels or don't have a single family home where you can hang them on and, and all of a sudden you don't have an energy burden. Well, that doesn't mean that folks in multifamily housing should be all of a sudden taking all of our energy burden because we can all afford solar panels or batteries or whatever. So insulation um, even. If you don't own the house, you can't insulate. I mean, there's just a lot of things that we might not think about. So engage early on and, and we'll come up with some great solutions for everyone. Absolutely. And, and Maria said it while well, talking about building codes, you know, yep. uh, they need to be built. Houses need to be built with a minimum of insulation. If we were California, which we're not, but, you know, they're now all new homes are built to net zero code. Um, that's that's a big stretch. How do we do that with our thermal load? Well, there are different ways. And, and I'm very confident that the smart folks within our University of Wisconsin system will, will really be able to figure that out. I mean, we already have geothermal, we already have heat pumps, we already have a lot of ways to get there. Um, but I think we can still refine them. And, and obviously, that's, that's the great work your researchers are doing. Um, well, any other questions, please put them in the chat, folks. We're really excited to have you all engaged here. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Professor Geary from UW-Madison now to talk about uh, some of the partnerships that, that we've formed and, and that he's formed. He is um, a professor with the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison who has been, his research program covers the major aspects of power conversion systems in different application areas of electric power generation, distribution, transmission, and utilization systems. The horseshoe, the water wheel, the windmill, the steam engine, these systems for energy transport and power conversion have always been at the forefront of the human imagination and Geary makes them come alive on a daily basis. So I'll turn it over to you, sir, to talk a little bit about uh, what you're doing here in uh, Madison. Thank you very much, Megan. Uh, I don't know if I can sort of do any justice to that introduction you gave me, uh, starting from the horseshoe down to where we are today. Um, in any case, uh, I want to talk about uh, partnerships and uh, at the university, uh, at Milwaukee, Madison, other universities across the state, you know, Green Bay, Oshkosh, across, think of it, and also the technical college systems where a lot of the training and the, where the rubber meets the road takes place. We're all here to uh, educate uh, our workforce here, as well as innovate to develop inventions to power our future. And there's plenty of technologies that we have developed that we would love to work with industries here in the state to deploy them in the state and out of state as well. And um, if you look at the Infrastructure Investment Act that uh, Joe introduced and gave link to the 
White House. There are many aspects on the transportation side, clean energy side, that open up major opportunities that are available for uh, state utilities, state government, as well as uh, uh, nonprofits, national labs, universities, schools, school districts. They're targeted towards various places where we can use innovations in clean energy. And we are ready to partner with whoever the stakeholders are. I just want to give you one example of something that the University of Wisconsin, Madison, City of Madison, private sector, and other groups have come along in response to a call from the Public Service Commission Office of Energy Innovation to develop a plan for a community resilience center in South Madison. This has stakeholders of various kinds. You can't expect us to see at a dinner table or sitting at a counter in a, in a dive location in the middle of somewhere. But uh, this uh, call from the Public Service Commission was able to bring us together, respond, and get positive results on funding for dual planning for towards the deployment. And hopefully the deployment will come in the future. And what we're hearing from Megan and Joe and White House and various other um, people that hold the levers of power and dollars is that we are going to see more opportunities for that. And I cannot apply for that money. And you cannot apply for that money on your own. We have to come together. And I'm really happy that um, uh, the Office of Energy Innovation, Wisconsin Energy uh, Institute and WARF and agencies have brought us together. This is, I think, a beginning. And um, so as these opportunities come out on board, you know, photovoltaics in tribal locations or energy storage in schools, resilience uh, metrics to improve resilience metrics in uh, county operations and wherever it is, the opportunities are going to be endless. But we have to expand our imagination to bring us together so that we can apply for these funds and take the technologies that are, can be developed, that are being developed in our companies, our industries in the state, in Milwaukee, Green Bay, Appleton, you know, Fond du Lac, wherever you're talking about. We have industries that are working in the energy space and we want to come together with them, with the electric utilities, school districts, tribal governments, come what may. And these calls are not going to be for single entities. It is important for us to come together. And that is a major difference from where we, how you used to work. You know, probably about 100 years ago, our state invented the idea called the Wisconsin idea that brings the university to the people of state to solve the problems. And we're reaping those benefits a thousand years out from all the innovations that took place in dairying and agriculture. And it's about time for us to sort of reinvigorate this and hopefully we can see this as an opportunity for us from the energy space to come together. So I will stop there and perhaps have more questions come up. Uh, there's a lot of listening going on here so we can have an interactive conversation for the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Gary. And I noticed your shirt is from the Wisconsin Electric Machines and Power Electronics Consortium, another great example of a, of a public-private partnership, right? Uh, there's uh, quite a few different, you know, big corporations in that partnership, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? We have small businesses that have only eight people or 18 people all the way to Fortune 500 global manufacturing operations that have thousands of employees, billions of dollars of revenue, but they're all equal in front of us. We work with all of them equally. We provide the services we need, mainly research innovation, educational innovation, training their workforces, road mapping, bringing us together so that uh, we can innovate in the space of electric machines, power conversion, power control area. And just to give an example, our labs uh, on our uh, Madison campus were very, very deeply involved in some of the wind energy innovations that took place 30, 40 years ago. 
Another set of innovation that took place in electric machines 40 years ago, or I'm sorry, 30 years or so ago, those are seeing spaces, all the wind energy innovations you see in big size turbines, all the way to offshore turbines. Look at electric vehicles, electric transportation, not only on passenger vehicles, buses, looking at um, off-road construction vehicles, John Deere, Caterpillar, mining trucks, they've all benefited from working with us over these 40 or so years since we've been, the consortiums that have been. And we have been working in this area of microgrids, integrating my, um, energy storage with solar, other devices for about 20 years from now, uh, 20 years ago now, and they have become reality now. They're ready for going into the next level and deployment and demonstration. So the innovations we're doing now are going to see out 20 years from now, but we're ready to work with you all and getting our ideas, our innovations out in the hands of people. That's pretty much what we're here about as part of the state of Wisconsin. That's what taxpayers funds are supporting us. Thank you again for pumping up a little bit on the uh, tagline for Mount Beck. I don't have a great uh, background like you have. Uh, <laughs> Badger and the flag, but I have a black ball. <laughs> right. Hey, Thanks. well, that, but that's what it's all about in workforce. You know, that's something that you just underscored there too. Workforce is such a huge part of this transition. And rest of you speakers, if you'd like to uh, share your video, maybe we could spotlight you again, just so folks folks think about a, a question for you. Um, they see your smiling face, they'll want to ask you. Um, but, you know, I think that as, as the rest of us, we look at, okay, it's not quite enough money. We're going to need to leverage public money with private dollars. We're going to need to put together these partnerships. You know, Andy mentioned it. Uh, Gary, you underscored it. You know, uh, electronics, power, and controls. We're good at that here. We've been doing that for a long time. So leveraging that, that's that's sort of the key to the grid of the future. And I, I really appreciate, Gary, you bringing up the microgrid project, um, which I thought of as a microgrid, but I learned through public comment and from my colleagues at the university, we prefer to call it a community resilience center because that resonates more with the folks who we're serving. And that's what we need to hear because to me, it's all critical infrastructure. I like to put a label on it, call it security. Uh, but sometimes, you know, we need to understand what resonates with the community that we're serving and what they would like to see. Um, and, and just as, you know, uh, Gary, I'll, I'll put this to you first, but to the whole panel, what sort of a role do we think microgrids play in that resilient grid of the future? Thinking about storms are getting bigger. There's no such thing as a 500 year flood. Derechos are unpredictable and as strong as hurricanes. So how do we, if we can't bury every line, how do we harden this grid? What is the resilient grid of the future? Just off the cuff, you know, I you can revise it in 20 years. I'd say we've all tightened our belts and gone through ups and downs. Whenever things happen, we always have to think about how to use our resources most effectively to get to the people with the most need to bootstrap ourselves up again. And that type of vision is what we need to, we would have to feed into our grid operations, we think about 44799's reliability of electric power for all of us all the time. And that is going to be history in the future. And what we have to think about is being smart about where we use our energy, when we use our energy, who gets it. And this gets into these, some of these interesting things called energy rationing, but we won't go there. We're smart. We can come up with various different ways of thinking about market-based market approaches, community-based approaches to figuring out where the critical needs are. But the idea is bootstrap everybody up, not leave anybody behind. And that is a very, very important part of it. We have new businesses, new ideas coming up from the state, Milwaukee area, Madison area, up Green Bay area, that are trying out various ways of integrating energy systems together. For lack of better word, we may call it a microgrid. These are sort of small scale energy units that are able to provide, keep the lights up going until we get the energy back up again across the board. And these businesses are looking for demonstration aspects. Where can we put them? Unfortunately, I would say right now, 
our regulatory utility model cannot easily accommodate these innovations. And that is where we have to invent the future in collaborations with the utilities and industry and vendors and community. We want all of it to work for all of us. I'll say maybe I could stop there. Maybe Andy can do it on as well. Yeah, I'd just like to, you know, uh, think a little bit about the internet of energy, right? Where we're sharing back and forth and we're storing a little ourselves. Uh, we're gonna have more electric vehicles. Those are big battery systems. They could run your house. They could run critical infrastructure. The way you control your house during an outage is important too. You maybe don't need to run the refrigerator all the time. You certainly wouldn't wanna run your, your washer, your dryer or something like that. So controlling that. So a very smart system that controls how you're using energy and how you're borrowing it. And if your neighbor has a battery pack on their house and they're still on the grid, maybe sharing some of that battery power with you or they're not using it, they're out of town, but their battery pack is full. So how do you, how do you load that up and manage it and bring it back down? And, and really it's, it's, it's about sharing. It's a different way of thinking about it. It's not just getting power from the grid, it's giving power back to everybody and moving it around and storing it a little like, uh, yourself. So we'll get there. Um, it's very complicated, but but you can see it's already creeping in. Um, somebody like Generac, right? Generac, they make the generators here in Waukesha. Uh, they're not just looking at generators now. They're looking at generators and battery packs, and they're looking how that hooks to solar and wind. And so they're thinking of that whole house solution. So that house will be less on the grid and be able to share energy back to other people at times of need. So it'll be a lot of load leveling too, right? So you can load up your batteries when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining, and then you can draw them down. And so it's gonna be a very dynamic system, a lot different than, than just getting the power from, from the power source, right? From the utility. Um, and of course the utility has to be involved. We need them to share, right? I can't give you power unless I'm working with the utility. So everybody's gotta be involved in this solution. Maria, thoughts on the... Uh... My fire alarm is going off. Oh no! Well, then what I heard right, first—it so just, it just oh, stopped. Over. My husband's cooking. I hope everything's okay. Um, so, <laughs> um, I did want to—I did want to just say that, like, it's really going to take some investment in technology um, deployment and and support. And I think there's um, we want to look at the way that we can develop these technologies get them into play, like support pilots uh, for utilities, um, large scale energy storage, long term energy storage, carbon capture, renewables, advanced nuclear, hydrogen, like zero carbon fuels. Like we want to look at all of the different resources that are available to Wisconsin. Um, we also want to look at the hard to, hard to tackle industry. Like I think of like manufacturing and, and industry and like, um, one of the things that we have in the clean energy plan is like high value conservation and looking at the ways that we can capture waste heat and reduce, like, what can we do now, right? Ultimately, we'd like to see some administrative and legislative action around this to support incentives. Um, but right now, obviously, we're not in a legislative session. We're, you know, we're not in a budgetary session, like, but thinking about the programs that we have now, focus on energy, the infrastructure structure law funding. Um, and then, and then, you know, like kind of building that out and figuring out what can we incentivize now and how can we support the research and development and the pilots now. And then I'll, and then, you know, really building and expanding those opportunities later through legislation and administrative code. Um, the other thing is expanding our tax credits and, and our business credits um, through economic development. Um, and some of the language, even just subtle changes within our tax, um, research and development tax um, credits, that it doesn't include energy storage or, or um, hydrogen or some of the newer technologies. So it's also being forward thinking so that we're, um, you know, those opportunities where we do have to incentivize or fund, um, we, we try to do that, but then also supporting um, these innovative efforts as, you know, as much as we can, even without incentives and supporting the business development and the economic development and getting people talking together. What I found like bringing people together and convening really actually moves the needle a lot. So it seems like it wouldn't have a huge impact, but getting people together 
um, getting the technology deployed and supporting uh, as many different angles as we can is really, I feel like, what, what it's about. Yeah, well said, well said. And I appreciate you put the link to the new executive order from Earth Day for the Office of Environmental Justice that the governor has created. Uh, you know, and again, starting that conversation at the highest level is so important to have that top down approach. Um, because I think that just sparks things. And, and that's, you know, one of the things we're trying to do here at our at our level is just talk about this collaboration. What does what does grid resilience look like when you know, you've got 2.5 billion that's going to come to states in a formula grant, but then another 2.5 billion is going to be open to all the utilities, nonprofits, for profits, whoever, in a competitive grant. So I think, you know, you're really looking um, at that by this fall, we're going to want to have partnerships with regulators because, uh, you know, as you mentioned, there's the regulatory environment right now may not be the most inviting. We have a, a lot of, you know, really smart people over at the commission who are working on refining those regulations or interpreting them every day and, and understanding what we do have the power to do through pilot projects and, and what might need to be a legislative or policy shift in, in the near future. Um, but certainly as a region, you know, because none of this stuff stops at state borders, obviously, but as, as a region, we've got the, you know, we've got goals. Every state in the region has these uh, zero carbon electricity goals and our utilities do too. So that is a fantastic opportunity now to just, to just get there <laughs> in a way that, that is efficient and, uh, and really, as you know, as you all mentioned, brings up everyone at once, doesn't leave anyone behind, and particularly not the most vulnerable among us who are already the most impacted by climate change. And I think that's why we're seeing, you know, Wisconsin has 11 federally recognized tribes. We're seeing so much advanced energy work from our tribal nation partners. Uh, the Bad River Tribe of Lake Superior Chippewa, for example, has a microgrid project where they're linking three existing microgrids so that they can understand that grid of interactive, efficient building that we need. That again, Maria mentioned, Andy mentioned, you all mentioned, we need to be able to shift those loads in a smart way that doesn't necessarily inconvenience everybody because we're used to our, <laughs> boy, without electricity right now, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But how do we do that in the, in the smartest possible way? And I think um, that's why we're so excited to partner with the university system on this because we need those, those young minds to, uh, to show us the way. And, and certainly I encourage all the folks on the call, if you have any questions and we've got this panel for just a few more minutes, um, love to, to hear your thoughts, feedback. Um, we've, got, we've got someone in the audience who's focused on hydrogen fuel cell propulsion for aircraft. That's fascinating. I saw a prototype for an electric airplane at the, a recent meeting of the state energy officials. And you know, it seemed great for like island hopping in Hawaii, perhaps, but it was a really small plane. <laughs> and you know, I'm thinking you wouldn't want to get caught on that eight hour trip, uh, perhaps right now. But maybe fuel cells are, are a more sustainable solution. You know, we, we thought the fuel cell cars might be more along the way but that's such a, it's a trick with infrastructure. Maria, you've got a, a strong background in transportation. Any thoughts there on sort of what you're seeing coming down the pike? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of what you're seeing right now is discussion around the infrastructure law and the funding that's coming to each of the states. So this, our state is slated to get $79 million uh, for EV infrastructure and the state is putting together a plan for electrification. And so the first phase is likely gonna be the, the build out of the infrastructure and focusing in on the passenger vehicles. But the thing about it is that there, there are a lot of opportunities beyond the passenger vehicles. And so the state is involved with a, a regional effort, the REV Midwest Coalition to look at medium duty and heavy duty opportunities. And that's really gonna have an impact on the, on the grid. Um, so, you know, it, like, Again, thinking about you know medium duty, heavy duty, ready stations. Like, are you know are we thinking being forward thinking? Um, a lot of um, you know, do we want to couple that with renewables that is, that are being built out? So um, you know, I there's a lot going on in the electric vehicle space, um, and there's and it's super exciting. Um, but there's still you know there's still a lot of unanswered questions. And I think with some of the planning efforts that are happening, we'll see at least a more 
clear roadmap um, on where Wisconsin's headed in the, in the near future. Yeah, and I'd just throw out that, you know, we might not make the electric vehicle here, but we probably are going to make the gas pump. I guess I'll put quotes on gas pump. Uh, I mean, those, that electric infrastructure that's charging those those cars is probably going to have components or the whole thing built in Wisconsin and come out of our our technology and our students and our, our, our factories. And so I think that's our probably our best play in the EV market. And, and it'll be great uh, because we have that long history already. I'm glad you brought that up because we also um, are doing as part of the planning analysis for the infrastructure build out, um, WEDC Economic Development Corporation is also doing an analysis on supply chain and electrification. So we're gonna right. you know, two, for the, two for the price of one, be able to get um, you know, that, that analysis as well as the infrastructure analysis. Yeah, so they're looking at the components that go into the cars, they're actually looking at micro mobility and then they're gonna look at the gas pump side of things too, yes. which, is, which is awesome. Yeah. yeah. I need a better term than gas pump. <laughs> but everybody knows what I mean when I say that, so. <laughs> yeah, because you don't want to call it fueling. That feels like a liquid fuel. <clears throat> Charging, but it's not as cool as gas pump. It just rings better. So, yeah. True. This is the juice pump. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the juice plug. I'm, yeah, I'm constantly running out of juice on my, my cell phone. So maybe we, <laughs> we can coin something for Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That reminds me of a great project uh, really quickly just that we did with um, with Geary's students last summer. He put together on a, a Soul Olympics makeathon, uh, which was a competition of students to create a solar energy kiosk. The winning design was a little free library with an electric solar panel on it. You can use it to charge your phone. They'll be deployed at the uh, microgrid in South Madison, the UW's building, well, will build hopefully once we uh, get through the feasibility study. But um, just little things like this are also about resilience. Just, just a solar panel and a battery sitting in your neighborhood behind some good books. Um, you know, we, we had a really amazing reaction to that project uh, when some students took it out to Peace Park. It, more people took books out of it than charged their phone, which I thought was also telling about Madison. <laughs> people want to read, um, but it, it is indicative of the power of partnerships that that never would have happened without without Geary and his students and their spark, and also the Great Lakes Community Conservation Corps folks from Milwaukee and Racine, a group of uh, you know folks who train veterans and formerly homeless young adults to to put, install solar panels to take away invasive plants and to even do some emergency response planning. So, so um, can, can go ahead. Can I, can I do a shameless plug here? Please. I don't know how many homes among the people that are in this audience, if you lose power, how many hours of backup you uh, you have for your, your cell phone? <laughs> how many hours of backup you have for your furnace fan? How many hours of backup you have for your router that's sitting in the basement of your home? I mean, these are opportunities that are small, but large numbers. We can think about innovatively in Wisconsin, create opportunities that can go into every house in the state and every person's back pocket, every person's backpack. And and I, I think there's big is better, big is beautiful, big is big. There's also small is beautiful uh, uh, opportunities that we can go on that could change how people think about how they use energy. And I know in my home, we don't have backup power for furnace fans. We don't have backup power for internet. I'm still looking for a solution that is you listed, that can work with the circuit, and that can be that is manufactured at scale. I know friends who are putting something together, cobbled up. If something happens, insurance companies are gonna like it. So we gotta think about engineering these things as opposed to putting it together as sort of weekend warriors. We're over time. Back to you, Megan. Yeah. No, absolutely. That was, that's a great way. That's a great way to end it. I, I think you know, with the innovation, 
in our university system with support from the rest of us. And we could have had so many other state agencies on this. We wanted to really focus on energy because energy is sort of the underpinning for everything, but economic development and the environment, I mean, it's all connected and we're, we're all committed to, to all of it. Um, but I, I just, I love that example of just sort of thinking about things differently and designing the future to meet our needs. So with that, I want to just thank this amazing panel. Thank you, WEI. Thank you, Joe. Um, I really appreciate everyone's time here today. And, and please follow up with us with any other questions um, or requests for partnership or just a conversation. We'd be happy to, uh, happy to talk to you anytime. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. Thanks. thanks, Megan, and thanks for moderating this, and thanks to our panel, and, and like Megan said, please reach out to the Office of Ener Energy Innovation if you have ideas and want to partner. I hope to see uh, many of you uh, in, in the future. Right now.